Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to One Breath Rising Second Sunday series. We are so pleased this afternoon to present Kim Coleman Foote, and she is going to read from her wonderful novel. And I do mean it is wonderful because I have read it, <laughs> and I strongly encourage everyone to get it. It's called Coleman Hill, and everybody should get a copy of this fabulous book. Uh, and we're so pleased to have Kim today to, to read us an excerpt from it and to talk about how she came to put this book together. It's such a beautifully written, uh, intricate uh, portrait of a family through generations. As a matter of fact, I want to read one of the quotes from the back of the book uh, done by Jeffrey Renard Allen. He says, this stunning debut stitches together a rich layered narrative of two connected and conflicted African-American families. These people endure misfortunes from one generation to the next, their lives offering heartfelt testimony to our ability as black people in this country to make a way out of no way. So I want to uh, introduce Kim to you. And Kim, we are, again, so honored to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Coleman Foote. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you all for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, so I thought that I would read an excerpt from, so first of all, Coleman Hill is inspired by my real life family and their great migration journey coming up from Alabama and Florida to Vauxhall, New Jersey, um, which is very close to where I grew up in Essex County, New Jersey. And um, it starts out with the stories of my two great maternal great grandmothers um, and their, their journey coming up following their husbands who would have come up first around 1916. And I was always fascinated by their stories because both of them, their, their husbands died not long after they moved up to Jersey and they each had about five kids and they never remarried. They were able to purchase their own homes. Home ownership in this part of my family is not you know, something that's common. Um, they bought their own homes working on a you know, domestic um, salary. And so I was always fascinated by, by their experiences. So I'm gonna read an excerpt from one of my great grandmother's sections. And this one is entitled, The Meanest Woman. Also, each of the sections begins with a family photograph or artifact. And so this is the one beginning this section. So circa 1926. It's almost eight and Solomon isn't home. Lucy Grimes pauses again and scrubbing the dishes to check her watch one of her first gifts from Solomon in New Jersey. Lucy often forgets to wind it. Solomon's comings and goings used to be good enough, a good enough timekeeper. Each morning he sprang awake minutes before their alarm clock, set for five, could ring. Evenings, he walked into the house at six, just as the children were setting the table for supper. No color people's time for him, even if he'd spent most of his years marking the hours by sunlight. Lucy peers through the kitchen window again, hoping to spot her husband, but the world outside is unmoving, the color of his skin. She can see nothing except her reflection in the glass backlit by the ceiling fixture, recently electrified. What would Celia Coleman do? And the decade that Lucy and her friend have lived in Vauxhall, Celia's advice has never failed. That includes the best recipe best homemade tonics for mumps, measles, and fevers, and hush-hush spices for recipes, all of which Celia got from her mama, who she said was part Indian. Lucy's church sisters find Celia rather coarse and have suggested Lucy not associate with her. She isn't a member of Bethel AME besides. If Celia is abrasive, Lucy thinks, it's because she doesn't fear standing up for herself, unlike Lucy's other tidy, bow-wrapped friends. Celia does take the Lord's name in vain, like Solomon's mother, which rubs Lucy the wrong way. And Celia likes to partake in liquor and tobacco at home, but she's rarely one to gossip about others' behavior, like most women. 
nor does she frown at Lucy's mistakes or laugh at her worries, however trivial they seem. Lucy wishes she could call, could call her friend, but neither of them own phones. Celia lives a short walk away on Waldorf Place, but Lucy can't leave the children unattended at this hour. Celia has gone cold regardless since the incident in her basement last month. Lucy's church sisters have warned her that Solomon might start coming home late, and their advice was to forget it. Ignore it when the good book forbade fornication. If they'd known what Lucy had done that morning, they'd also say she had herself to blame. She'd woke before Solomon, wanting to make biscuits for him and the children, but the butter she spent a month of Sundays churning, which she put in the icebox before bed to harden, had sat on the table. By the soupy look of it, it, was, it had to be spoiled. She felt like screaming. Such behavior, though, was unbecoming. Her adoptive mother, Miss Horn, had drilled into her that Lucy should aspire to be a lady, even if she had to step aside for white ones in Alabama. Solomon's mother was behind the butter. It had happened twice before, and each time the woman had waited until Solomon was in earshot to bless Lucy out. She did likewise that morning. You must think money grow on them damn rose bushes of yarn. The prices on everything around here going up. Ain't never met nobody so careless and just standing there like a big old cow in the road. Lucy started shaking from that thing inside her. It had been trying to come up since her mama died, but she pushed it down like usual until her body got hot. Solomon gave Lucy a knowing look from across the kitchen as he tried to shush his mother. They all paused when Bertha, Lucy and Solomon's oldest, burst in yelling, Mama Stella, it wasn't her. I left it out. It was me who did it, not mom. The air in the kitchen felt staticky. Bertha was usually quiet and kept to herself like Lucy. Now she stood with her feet apart, fists at her sides. At 13, her body was already taking on the curves inherited from Lucy and the mother. The girl whom Lucy birthed in Alabama was no longer a girl if the shenanigan in Celia's basement hadn't already let her know. Why you be blaming mom for everything? Bertha added. Lucy didn't think children were best seen and not heard, but she taught hers to respect their elders, their grumpy grandma included. Solomon's mother would blame her for Bertha's outburst too. Lucy didn't like to beat her children either, but she itched to find the slipper she used for Bertha a few weeks earlier and whoop her again for acting so grown. When the mother slapped Bertha, though, that thing inside Lucy rose again. Without thinking, Lucy rushed around the table. As her hand shot out at the mother, she wished she could have shoved Bertha too, just like Celia had a month ago. The mother slammed against the buffet, rattling the dishes inside. Don't you touch my children, Lucy said, even though she'd shocked herself with the force of her push. She couldn't recognize her own voice either, low and strained as it was, like Celia's when something riled her. Lucy had the strange sensation that nothing could hurt her, and as she gasped to get her breath back, she took pleasure seeing fear in the mother's eyes. But Bertha looked scared too, and that shamed Lucy. The next thing Lucy knew, Solomon's morning breath was hot in her face. God damn you, Lucy, get out of my house. That thing in Lucy tried to come up again as she thought about how she and Solomon pooled their money every month for the landlord, and now it was his house, and he was taking the name, Lord's name in vain in front of her. Lucy stood there stunned as he went to embrace his mother, who ranted about how her backbone hurt, how Lucy might have broken something. The mother rested her cheek against Solomon's arm and smirked at Lucy. Lucy yanked Bertha into the parlor to stop herself from charging at the woman again. As she climbed the stairs to her bedroom to finish dressing for work, she recalled, as she did in these moments, that fire that happened to happen at their neighbor's house up the street shortly after, shortly after moving to New Jersey. That family of 10, also from Alabama, had lost the house and all their possessions in just a few hours, but at least they had each other, they said. The husband had rushed in multiple times to get everyone out, starting with the children, one under each arm. Lucy envisioned for the umpteenth time, waking to find her own house on fire. 
She knew in her bones that she needs to save herself, maybe the children too. Solomon would surely leap over her and out of bed to rescue his mother first. The floorboards creak upstairs now and Lucy slides her eyes to the ceiling. The mother who goes to bed with the roosters. Lucy hears the squeak of bed springs and the thump and senses the old goat getting down on her knees for prayers. Probably thanking the Lord that Solomon has fallen for some hussy that evening. Anybody to replace his wife. Lucy's hands slow in the suds as she wills the mother to keel over, gag, and die. Then squeezes her eyes shut, asking him for forgiveness for her unholy thoughts and, wanting, and for wanting to take away Solomon's mother when she's lost her own. Her church sisters think she likes to make mountains out of molehills about her mother-in-law. To them, Miss Stella Grimes is the dearest of ladies, if stingy with words. When they visit Lucy at the house or meet her on the street with the mother, they see a stout, neatly dressed, brown-skinned woman who starts humming spirituals and making herself scarce. Giving Lucy her privacy, they think, jealous. But it's the woman's way of hiding her true self from the world, the one who, re who revels, it seems, in haranguing her daughter-in-law. Even if Lucy's church sisters knew the awful ways the mother treats her, they would say, a mother-in-law who don't like you? That's the oldest story in the world. Or they might say what Miss Horn did just before Lucy joined Solomon up north. The Lord only give us what we can handle. When Lucy boarded the train in Dothan, the main thing she wished to leave behind in Alabama wasn't the white folks with their hard stares and trigger happy fingers, their low wages and rudeness. It was Solomon's mother. After Solomon went to New Jersey, drawn by those Yankee speculators' promises of employment, Lucy prayed he would send only for the children in her once settled. She kept hoping until she received his letter. There's a ticket for mama too, sweetheart. I thought she could help with children's. Lucy went cross-eyed at that. The mother had a dozen grandchildren between Solomon's sister Dinah and her recently departed twin, mostly boys, which the mother seemed to prefer. And she lived with them all up in Reader's Mill, where Solomon had grown up. On the mother's rare visits to Solomon and Lucy and Hetland, she had griped about him moving so far away after marrying. She had also stood over Lucy's first two ba babies, Bertha and Pearly, when they were born, inspecting the color behind their ears and muttering that they were too light to be so her sons. After coming to New Jersey, she claimed Lucy's two boys as Solomon's, but the only girl she accepted was the fourth born, Nell, who was as dark as Solomon with the same jet black silky hair. When Lucy had confronted Solomon about his mother's ins insinuations, he'd said Lucy must have heard her wrong. Lucy itched to shout at both of them. Who could she fool around with in Barber County, even if she were a sinner? Before Solomon, Lucy, Lucy hardly had options. The pews at church grew emptier every Sunday, it seemed, as boys of marrying age took off for faraway places like Chicago and Detroit and Harlem. Lucy refused to look for a husband at those sinful ju jukes like some girls her age, nor did she horse around in the fields before the eyes of God to force a man to marry her. After eight months of daily prayers, she'd managed to attract just one suitor, a widower approaching his fifties with barely two teeth in his head. But he owned his own farm, unlike most colored people Lucy knew. And as Miss Horn said, looks ain't never fed nobody. Lucy, 18 and feeling like an old maid, almost resigned herself to him until some neighbors invited her to a revival down in Dothan. The ghost took hold of her during the many guest sermons, bringing her a welcome joy. But what struck her most was the boy preacher who promised miracles. He could conjure rain for desperate farmers, restore a blind person's sight, dance with snakes around his neck without getting bitten, mend broken hearts. Lucy left Miss Horn's side to wait in line with the others eager to unload their burdens. She stood on her toes, watching parishioners up ahead fall out sweating, crying, jerking, shouting. She was practically doing the same before that little brown hand touched her forehead and made, some, made something jolt through her. She dropped to her knees and arched her head skywards, hollering hallelujahs, tears squeezing from her eyes. 
As she maneuvered back to Miss Horn, sniffling, a bounce in her step, a handkerchief poked through the crowd and stopped in front of her face. It belonged to a tall, midnight-colored man who asked in an unbelievable baritone if he could call on her sometime. She didn't think a miracle could happen that fast, but agreed to his request. When he proposed marriage on their fifth outing, she agreed to that too. He was a God-fearing man who'd gone all the way to the eighth grade like her. He could write and cipher like no one else she knew and had a smile that made sweat rush behind her ears. Man looked like he'd been cooked in the furnace, people would say behind his back, snickering. Lucy knew they meant to insult him, but it made her cover her smirk, thinking, more like my furnace from now on. What she discovered too late was that she wouldn't be his number one woman. When Lucy voiced concern to Miss Horn that Solomon's mother might ruin her marriage, the thin old woman regarded her with her flat, rimy eyes and said, the Lord bless you with a good husband, good cheerings, Lucy. Y'all is family. That's terrible more than we had. Make do with what you got. Lucy left her house disappointed, then asked herself why she expected much different. Miss Horn had been considerate enough to raise Lucy and her siblings after they were orphaned, but the woman never showed affection like Lucy remembered her mama doing never hugged them when they got hurt or fell ill, and certainly never let them call her mama. Yes, Lucy thinks, drying one of the supper plates. God has blessed her, as her church sisters also like to remind her. She is not a slave, nor was she born one like Miss Horn, whose 16 children either died young or got sold away before emancipation, who has whipping scars on her back, who cringes when touched. Solomon's mother, ornery as she is, is no plantation overseer who can beat Lucy, no master who can take away her husband or children. But the woman has brought this order to Lucy's household, and it keeps getting worse. Solomon is a better husband than most, a big but gentle man who provides for his family, who doesn't drink, who barely raises his voice. But that morning, because of his mother, he blessed his wife out and told her to leave their home. Where will it end? He smells like kerosene. Lucy notices it as soon as he enters the kitchen, swarmed by the children who grasp at the many pockets in his dusty work overalls. Her church sister is said to expect liquor or perfume, not kerosene. Then again, with that prohibition in full swing, folks are concocting all sorts of craziness in their bathtubs. Lucy turns her back to Solomon and continues drying the dishes. The floor shudders as his footsteps approach, and Lucy stiffens her shoulders, wondering if he'll kiss her cheek as usual. What would Celia do? The Celia before her gem died seemed reserved and timid until you saw her eyes, the stare that froze your heart that shows she wouldn't hesitate to cut you. The Celia after Jim's eye continued comporting herself like a lady in public until something set her off. Like the time she supposedly beat her bow outside the movie theater, Vauxhall's gossip circuit said he tried to hit her first. Or when Celia caught Bertha in the basement, asking her boy Jebby to play Dr. Jack from the picture show and flung Bertha outside like a rag doll. But even if Lucy is double Celia's size, Lucy lacks her friend's gumption to confront Solomon the way she did her mo his mother that morning. The children scream in delight as they start finding the candies in Solomon's pockets. They used to greet Lucy after work like that, even when she arrived empty-handed, but they stopped in the months since Lucy tasked Bertha with mining them after school. These days, when Lucy walks in, she finds the older children scattered around the parlor, deep in concentration over their schoolwork or at the piano practicing a tune. Lately, Bertha always seems to be changing the baby just as Lucy arrives, as if she's waited for the moment she hears Lucy on the stoop. Bertha has also begun answering Lucy's questions with a sassiness that irks her, sometimes mumbling around the, the diaper's safety pin. Yes, ma, I been started supper. Yes, ma, I gave them they bath. Yes, ma, I drew extra water for you. Lucy folds her arms across her chest and opens her mouth to chastise Bertha for leaving the baby unattended in the parlor and the children for disturbing their grandma's sleep. But as Solomon grabs the candies, 
back from whichever child he can and dangles them above his head in jest. Her annoyance fizzles. Solomon laughs down at the hopping children, his broad shoulders shaking, and nearly misses Bertha's hand at the bib of his overalls. A peppermint roll, Lucy's favorite, sticks out of it. This one for your mama, baby girl, Solomon says, finally meeting Lucy's eyes. He gives her a puppy look, as if offering an apology, but Lucy homes in on his ripped sleeve. He winces as he pulls the candy from Bertha's hand. His eyes follow Lucy's, and he sticks the arm behind his back. He offers the peppermint with his other hand, but Lucy hesitates. What happened to your arm, Solomon? Nothing, Mama Bear, just a scratch. Mama Bear, the name he uses to make her laugh because it sounds silly to her, but now she can't even smile. He knows how she gets when someone is sick or hurt because of how her mama died. Lucy presses to see his wound, but he weighs her away. The children beg to see, jumping and clapping. Solomon's mother barges into the kitchen in her old-timey floor-length nightgown and bonnet. Her eyes are squinted, lips poked out. Y'all know I'm trying to sleep upstairs. What in God's name? Her eyes have caught the bandage. Lucy crosses her arms over her chest, thinking he gonna show it now. As the mother shuffles toward him, the children know to scatter. Solomon, assuring his mother it's nothing, rolls up his sleeve and exposes a bandage that gives Lucy chest pains. The kerosene smell floods the kitchen as he unwraps it and the children lean in. It does look like a scratch, if a long, jagged one. The children seem impressed by neither its appearance nor the story behind it. He slipped coming down a ladder at the end of his shift and cut himself on a nail. He awes the children finally by telling them he's helping to build the finest movie house in Irvington. He promises to take them to see a picture show when it opens and they fight to embrace him, Bertha especially, crazy as she is about the silver screen. That night in their room, Lucy lies in bed as Solomon plods around undressing. He pulls off his shirt with a grimace, then sits on his side of the bed and sighs. Lucy aches to crawl over and wrap her arms around his broad torso, feel the warmth of his skin, the beating of his heart, but not after that morning. He reaches across himself with his good arm and touches her cheek. She flinches. I know, he says, and she notices that there is indeed liquor on his breath. You thinking about your mama, sweet cake, ain't you? Her stomach clenches as it does when she eats too many sweets. The smell of damp newspaper on the walls comes as always. She hears her brother's screams from that morning. But I'm gonna be okay, Lucy, you hear? Her mama just had a cough. Three days later, she was dead. Lucy had jolted awake on the pallet she shared with her three siblings and their mama. Her brother was shaking their mama, whose lips were frozen into a smile. Lucy was around six, too young to understand why her siblings were bawling, why their mama's skin was so cold, why she didn't wait to embrace them. Lucy would pine for the comfort of her hug for years. The feeling had lessened when she started courting Solomon, but even now she yearns every so often to get folded into her mother's arms. She remembers resting her head in the crook of her mama's chin and feeling the buzz of her throat as she hummed as if it were yesterday. Solomon keeps repeating, you hear, until Lucy nods. She wants to ask him why he was out somewhere drinking when it could have gotten him thrown in jail. But after this morning, she no longer knows his limits and doesn't want to press him. And Lucy, I'm sorry about what I said this morning. It's just that, that's my mama, you know? She doesn't nod this time. She just recalls his sister, Dinah, who served as a witness when they got their marriage license, joking at the courthouse in Eufaula about how he would never cut the umbilical cord. Solomon stretches out on his side, looking at Lucy. She don't mean nothing by what she be doing to you, Mama Bear. She old and her mind ain't quite there all the time. You know she was born out during slavery and two husbands just up and died on her. We was five of us when my pappy died and she just buried my sister before we left down home. 
It's a real life, hard life she done had. Then he tries to slip his hand beneath her nightgown. Lucy tugs down the hem and turns her back to him, lying that she just started her monthly. As Solomon sighs and gets up to switch off the light, Lucy wants to snap about how his mother's behavior isn't just due to old age or slavery or grief. Stella Grimes' nickname in Alabama was the meanest woman in Barber County. So mean, rumors went, that she killed Solomon's father with just a look. Then she snagged another man right afterwards, so she didn't really raise all those children alone. True, the second husband was ancient, but when he died, people still whispered that she probably poisoned him and buried him in the yard. And I will stop there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What a family. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And that, and that's not the birth. That's not the only woman ancestor that people have said that about. There have been uh, on different sides of the family. Yeah, about husbands being buried in the yard. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's my> family. <laughs> well, I do have a question of uh, yes. Mother Stella. Uh, yes. How much of that was true <laughs> about the <their> husbands? <laughs> um, it was, it's well about the buried in the yard part. <laughs> no, that, that the number. <laughs> <laughs> um so mama stella um she did have at least two husbands that that much i know i mean it was my great grandfather and i should say the the character inspired by my great grandmother um so there was my great grandfather and then she did marry this older older man farmer after <laughs> he was, he yeah. was ancient <laughs> <laughs> i mean he was only ancient because well actually i think she was probably in her 40s and he was like maybe in his 60s. 60? Yeah, which would have been ancient at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. He had he had grown children. He had, you know, so I don't know what that what that was about. Um, if it was a security thing or but you know, I have the the marriage record and yeah. In fact, the first census that I found on my family, it was that that particular family. I didn't I didn't even know her name. Um, I had no idea that my great grandfather had a stepfather, so I was just like, "Whoa, who are these people?" So, yeah. So that was one of the first discoveries that I made with actually my first like record discovery with genealogy. You know, the existence of this step great great grandfather. <laughs> okay, that's interesting because I I also am, am I've also embarked on doing the genealogy for yes. my family. Yes. And my mother is still alive. She's in her 80s. Yes. And she's, so she's, taking, mine. she's taking all this information that I've been finding in very good stride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you find out stuff and you're going, well, who the heck? What? Hmm? What? Yeah. There's all the people <laughs> who are forgotten, you know, intentionally, forgotten. I, intentionally I or that. otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like I, I found out that my great grandfather no my great great grandfather step grandfather uh -huh. he ended up he had like he must have had like two wives before my great yeah great grandmother and then he had another two wives after yeah and they didn't know nothing about these people and they were just coming up with all these children and i yeah and, and i'm telling you i had to be going through trying to okay these these group belong to this part and this yeah. part belong to this part I, i'm telling you my family tree is looking like i don't know what <laughs> these things and this is just one of them you know yeah so i, I completely understand that you, you get the census and you go huh Who yeah is <laughs> well the other but the other true story is my how many how other... much how much research had have you had to do to to put this book together well i mean i i love history i love historical research um but technically i've been hearing stories since i was a kid you know, so these stories about my family I've been hearing. And I didn't embark on genealogy until I was graduating from college. I mean, that was a while ago now, mm -hmm. uh, 20 plus years ago. But um, but yeah, I by the time I was doing the genealogical research, I'd already heard stories, you know, from so many family members. So I had, you know, kind of 
facts or like details to go yeah, on. Right. Um, and that's how I found that first census record. It was for 1900 in Barber County, Alabama. And so I only knew, I only knew the name of my great grandfather, you know, mm. um, but because his name was so unusual, I was able to find him, you know, very quickly but I didn't know about his mother. I didn't know her name. I didn't know the step grandfather, whatever stepfather. I didn't know his. He had siblings. I didn't know their names. And then I, I quickly found on that census that he named his son after his brother. You know, so mm -hmm. it was just yeah. So, so I, I I was able to amass a lot of um, records, census records at first. You know, and uh, so I was just doing this. This was my hobby. You know, this was just I, there was no book at this point. <laughs> right. No idea for a book. And so I, I did this for many, many years. Um, and then when I, you know, this, the book came about um, actually during my MFA program, um, which was also a long time ago, but I had an assignment for a class, a creative nonfiction class to um, write a story based on a family photograph. And I chose oh. one that actually appears in the book of my, my um, grandfather's three sisters as little girls. And the the one in the middle really, really struck me because she's like clutching this dog and she has this really fierce expression. And in all the family stories, she she was like evil, you know, no one had a good word for her. And to see her as a little girl, I guess it just really, really did something for me. And her voice just like literally spoke to me, you know, and came mm -hmm. out. And that is a section in the book now. So that was like the actual like first thing I wrote, you know, for the book. But it still wasn't a book. At that point, you know, right. I was just like writing it's these just, like snippets, you know, trying to like fictionalize, right. you know, incidents in my family. Um, and so I had all I had all the research basically amassed pretty much. I mean, I did have to like talk to my mother and other people who are still living just to like kind of get some details here. And they're like, oh, who was that who said such and such or how was the house and, you know, all these things. But like most of the quote research was done. You know, but it didn't feel like research necessarily because, again, this was just my that was for fun, you know. Right, right. right. Is it as you call it a creative nonfiction? Uh, this uh, this novel. Do you change a lot of the names of family yes. names as well? Yes. So, so obviously the Coleman. I'm I'm Coleman. Um. So Coleman and Grimes are my family names, but all of the first names have been changed. To, so, because I, I know that the title is Coleman Hill, and yes. your name is Coleman. So, yes. I was curious about whether or not you were, you know, uh, the, uh, with the umbrella of creative nonfiction, you were doing this with with, with family intact, you know, or yeah. divergent, uh, where you diverge from what your your history is. Yeah, and I just want to make clear, it is fiction. So um, it's, you know, it's in this interesting space between fiction and nonfiction, which and is fiction. why I borrowed the term right. biomythography from Audre Lorde, um, because I felt like that really, really described perfectly what I was doing in so many ways. You know, I was combining my actual family's history mm -hmm. and truth, you know, whatever, however you want to say, you know, because is it true what, what's on these historical documents like census records? Is it true what someone tells you in a story? And then, you know, the fact that someone else will tell a story that, you know, contradicts <laughs> either the records or someone else's story, right? Story, so right. Me, me taking those facts that I had, but then also having to use fiction, you know, I, I am a fiction writer, I've written fiction for, for a long time, because there were so many things that I didn't know. You know, my, my, great grandfather who inspired the character Solomon, who I just read. Um, I literally just knew one thing about him. Obviously he was from Alabama, I knew that much, but I just knew everyone just always talked about how he died of lockjaw and he was working on a, a, a movie theater. That's all I knew, that's all I knew going in. And so I had to figure out like, well, who was he as a person? You know, How did he meet my great grandmother? And what did he look like? I don't even know. I don't have a picture of him. You know, so all of that, all of the things that I read just now, I had to like really fill in, use my imagination to do that. I Did was you... wondering about that and how you, how you imagine like what it was like to be some raised by somebody who was raised to, uh, as an enslaved person. Yeah. And how harsh that reality would be and like the details of like never hugging and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to I wanted to put that in because um, so it was true that my great grandfather 
she she was orphaned when she was very young. I don't know what happened. No one ever mentioned her father, but I assume he was not in the picture. Maybe he died. But, you know, the, the story went that her mother did die when she was young. And so because, you know, the book, there are a lot of really mean mothers in this book. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, I have no idea what her mother was like, but I made a conscious decision that her mother would be someone who was loving, you know, and also the fact that this great grandmother, she was more like a maternal, like, you know, caring you know, figure from all the stories that I got. And so not to say that just because her mother was loving, she was like that, or just because someone's mother was cruel, that they were cruel. But I, I did, I did um, you know, choose that intentionally just to have some balance and contrast, you know, so that was intentional that I had made her mother affectionate also, but then her adoptive mother is kind of like this tense person, but it's not just She's a mean black woman just because they're we have mean, you know, angry black women. This is what her past is. This is what her history is. And I'm showing you blatantly what a lot of black women would have gone through and that trauma, you know, that would have affected how they mother people, children. Oh. How did you do the research? Did you like go to libraries or was it um so so <laughs> when I was doing the research back in the day this was I started in 2000 and so this was before like nothing was digitized at this point there was no mm -hmm. ancestry.com there was no google I don't even think google existed and so you had to actually go to a repository so I was living in DC um after college and so I had access to the library of congress and the national archives and I was actually doing a job for the Smithsonian. I was a research assistant where I had to go to the National Archives at times to like get historical documents. And so, but I would go there and um, I would like get the microfilms for the census. So this was microfilms, <laughs> you know, which, and like a hand cranked microfilm machine. Yeah, that, that really dates it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, a lot of this was like actually hard, hard labor, you know, and now it's just so easy. People are like, how do I get started? I'm just like, just Google, Google your family's name and you'll find stuff, you know. But yeah, you had to like physically go somewhere and like use microfilm. And crank it out. And research <laughs> aids and yeah. But I also interview family members, you know, um, I, I would set up interviews with them and talk to them. Some recorded, some I just took notes longhand. And those actually helped, um, you know, like to find some people in the records because again, a lot of people, memories were lost of certain people because um, I think like maybe they died so long ago that, and they weren't, um, you know, maybe they didn't have like some impactful relationship with the folks who were still living. So they were just kind of forgotten. But when I did the the interviews, it gave me like little clues and little snippets that I could go back to the documents and kind of link people up. So that was really cool. Wow. Mm. Wow. Now this chapter that you that you read, uh, what part of the book is it in? This is very early. I think this is the third, third chapter. Maybe, like one, two, three, the fourth, the fourth section. But it, it's very early because that that's basically, um, like I said, I wanted to start with my great grand. It's chronological. I wanted to start with my great grandmother's perspectives, and especially, like I said, that that was um, one of the things that you know made me want to write this book, seeing like what their experiences were like being these um, young mothers um, who who were widowed you know, and living in New Jersey, coming up from Alabama, coming to this completely yeah. different environment. So, yeah. Well, I don't want to give away too much of the story, <laughs> but I, I am, uh, I, I was uh, very intrigued by the uh, part of the book that was called How to Kill Grant <laughs> Coleman and Live to Tell About It. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, I read, I read the, the the title makes the title made me laugh. Yeah. But when I started reading that chapter, I was like, hmm, I wonder how many kids think about this. Um. <laughs> uh. Well, I, I'm gonna say I hope not a lot, but probably more than you know. And we give credit for because I yeah. was like, Whoa. yeah. <laughs> So again, also inspired by inspired by real events. Um, um, but I think I, I I talk about that in the author statement at the end of the book. Um, but uh, you know, the real the real story is that they just sat around talking about it. 
but those were the methods that they they that they came up with. That they came up with. <laughs> and the and the using the braids. I was just like, okay, how tragic comic is this that you <laughs> you you're you're thinking about killing someone with their own hair, right? Um so yeah, but I I, I just really I for, so for the fictional version, I wanted the children to actually play out the attempts. You know, because for me, I had always wanted to go back in time and be Greg home and myself, you know, on behalf see, of all right. these children who she traumatized, you know. And I was like, because my brother and I, we like listen to these stories like, but you said she was like four feet tall. Like, you know, couldn't, and there were so many of you, like, couldn't you just gang up on her? Like, why didn't you? And they're like, oh, but we were scared. And, you know, the children respected their elders back then. And we're like, you didn't respect her. That was, you were afraid of her. You know, she she put the fear into you, so you don't you you don't have to sh you don't have to um, command respect by hurting someone and terrorizing someone. You know, but, no, I, but I then we back. also have to think about the time that this book is the, the time periods that you go through. Oh, of course, and of where course. they were coming and where they were coming from, and then you realize. But 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 some of the children did fight back. You know, yes. so if if I so were back then, were that probably would have been me. Yeah, some of them were more feisty than others. <laughs> yeah, but, but when you look at the time period and what the experiences oh, yeah. actually were of the adults, then you could see how that, oh yeah, how that went through from one generation to the next, to the yes. next, to the next. Yes, and and you're like, wow, and you're like, <laughs> when you see it in a chronological time or line yeah. like that, it's like it's it's startling. It really is yeah. startling. It really is startling, you know, it's just like, whoa. But um, so I, I was gonna say, you know, I really loved how you um how you how you worked in some of the old wives' tales into the story, even in the <laughs> part that you read when you yeah. said about checking the ears. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. but that but that but that's a truth. That, yeah. that did, that does, no, it does, because they yeah. still do it. It does happen. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, in my family, it was, oh yeah, they look, when the child is born, they look uh -huh. at the ears at the top and to see what tone, what skin tone the child exactly. gonna come out, <laughs> the child is actually gonna be. And you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, it, but in actuality, that is what, that usually is what the child's skin tone is. Yeah. That little spot these right were, on the top of the ear. <laughs> you know, the, these were things that I grew up, you know, like there, there were a couple of details, like I mentioned um, Zora Neale Hurston's, um, I think it was an article that she had about like Harlem slang terms, you know, that I that I picked up some of that and filtered it through. But most of, most of what I have written in the book, again, when you talk about research, it's like things that I grew up hearing in my family or grew up knowing like, Another one of those is the burning of the hair when um, yes. the children are doing Greg Holman's hair. That was actually something I, I added later because I was like, oh, I didn't talk about the hair thing where she, you know, they braid her hair and she asks for loose hairs and burns it. Then burns my, mother, my mother did that every time when she was braiding my hair when I was a little girl, right? Mm -hmm. She would burn the hair in the ashtray. And it wasn't until I was in college and I was taking a, like a Black history um, course you know, that, that I learned that that was like something that was done in Africa. Right. And I was like, oh my, and my family, if you ask them, they wouldn't even know like, oh, this is African, like, Ur, you know, um, but that's something that was done in Africa because, you know, hair is, hair is seen as very powerful and, you know, witchcraft, people can do witchcraft with the hair. So the hair will be burned. You don't want any loose hairs, nails, skin, things like that. Right. And I was just like, oh, wow. Wow. But so there's, I think so many things like these, Africanisms, you know, in Black culture that we do certain things that we don't even realize the, the origin. So I the definitely to make sure to, to put some of those things in the book. Have you traced your family to Ghana? You mentioned oh, no. before. Oh, no. Oh, I was curious <laughs> because you mentioned that you had a, no. a, another book that you... Yeah, no, my original intent, um, starting out doing the genealogy. So I had actually studied abroad in Ghana. Um, oh, and. Okay. Yeah, when I was in college, college was very transformational to me because I entered college with perm, <laughs> synthetically straightened hair, and would not have dreamt of going to Africa in my life. 
Um, mm-hmm. I was going to go to Paris and study Francais, you know, because <laughs> Francais is the only, and Paris is the only place where you can learn Francais. And then someone was like, do you know that French is spoken in Africa? I was like, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> no, <what>? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Maybe. And a lot of Africa, but I was like, I'm going to Africa. Are you kidding me? Um, and so within two years, I like cut off my hair. I'd like stop perming my hair and I was going to Ghana. Woo. And so, um, so I, I got a lot really, really interested in ancestry and my African ancestry learning to like really appreciate that because I didn't grow up appreciating, you know, that wasn't in my family. And so, um, so I wanted to really trace, you know, to Africa, like Alex Haley had done with roots, but that's really, really, really difficult for um, yeah. a lot of African descendants and and this whole hemisphere, right. I would say, because um, you know the African people who were enslaved, they weren't seen as people. You know, they were seen as property or like commodities, and so no one was really thinking, oh, let's record their names and where they came from. And you know, no, it was number of women, number of men. Oh, right. and we had to dump some and not tell the insurance people that we dumped some. You know, so. So there's all that that happened. Um, and then I also find that um, for African-Americans in this country, you know, if if people were enslaved up through the end of slavery, um, those are the ones who typically um, don't have the stories about like, oh, this was my owner, this was my blah, blah, blah. I, I tend to find that for Black folks, if they're like, oh, I can trace my family back to 17, back to 16, it's typically because their ancestors were free for a long time and I kind of realized like oh well yeah if your ancestors were enslaved like you know again thinking about my great great grandparents who were born slaves coming out of that you weren't volunteering like oh yeah my, my slave master was such and such my mama got raped and I don't know who my mama is actually because she got sold away you know, like they weren't necessarily coming out and saying all that stuff and so I think that the reason like so there is um you know, the story about where the Coleman name comes from in my family. Um, And that came from my great, great grandfather, who I have a picture of him, um, who was born a slave. So when all people also say like, oh, that was so long ago, I have a picture of a man who was born enslaved in this country. He lived, um, he's, he was alive in 1920. He actually came up here to Jersey. Um, He, you know, when he was born, it was illegal for him to read and write. He didn't even own his own self. Right. I have a picture. Mm, of right. Me. And the thing is, um, I think that the reason why we have stories from him is because he was ha- he had dementia and he was just saying stuff, you know, because otherwise oh. other folks, other folks were not really, really talking and volunteering information. And even my mother and my father, you know, their generation, they would say that well, when we were kids, you just knew not to ask anything. You can you can go up to someone and say like, "Who's your mama? Who's your daddy?" You got you got smacked. Even today, that might be you know contentious. Going, "Who's your daddy?" Mm. <laughs> you know, so they they got slapped if they asked anything about the family history. So they learned to just not not ask. And so I think the reason again we have these snippets in my and this particular side of my family is because someone was talking, maybe not realizing what they were saying, and one of my aunts was there listening. Like, oh, this is interesting. And I, I like history, I like family, and just listening and absorbing and retelling, you know, these stories. Mm-hmm. I know that you mentioned uh, sections when you do before. When do you, with the format of your, your book, did it you not try, uh, uh, use chapters or did you use a type of sectional? were uh format um whether you want to call it sections chapters whatever you know that that's up to you i leave it up to the Mm -hmm. reader i call them sections um yeah uh let me see how i would describe it (laughs) there's also a poem you know in there so yeah there is a poem in here um your your writing is very much poetical thank you yeah but she she's been she's been around enough of us poets yeah <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna she's say i've had, I've had like poets <laughs> i have more more poet poet friends even since college more poet friends than um fiction writing friends and my poet friends have definitely influenced me strongly because i remember like this was like a whole other novel that i was working on when i was in college and 
one of my poor friends read it and she's just like, I can't taste these words. I'm like, you're not supposed to taste them. You're supposed to read them, you know? And I'm like, and you're getting tripped up on one sentence. There was like 20,000 more words to go. Could you read? Could you read? You know? And so like having, having that poet um, sensibility definitely influenced my writing. Right. It's, it's written in chronological, uh, a chronological, almost like a chronological journaling. Uh, mm. Okay. I'm, yeah. looking, yeah, forward that, that's, I'm looking forward was, to reading it. That was a decision too, because, um, so originally when I, when I, um, got my agents, that last section wasn't there mm. that had not been written. I mean, there, there had been a, uh, I had started something on that vein, but I hadn't finished it. And so originally it ended with a section entitled Man of the House um, and chronologically. And mm -hmm. my grandfather was a late addition to the book. Originally, I thought it was about, about the women uh, from the women's voices. And then my grandfather just barged in one day and I was just like, okay, fine, grandpa. Um, <laughs> but, but I was just like, but uh, I don't want you to get the last word as a dude. You know, you're the only dude. Um, you're kind of problematic. Like you're not getting the last word in this book. And so I changed the order. It was originally chronological. I changed the order to what, like more thematic. So he, just so he wouldn't get the last word. In the word. <laughs> and so my agent, you know, when she was discussing, looking at the book, she was like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But I think it works better chronologically. And then, you know, and she's like, but still like, you know, as a kind of cohesive um, narrative, you know, she just didn't feel like that was the right note to end on. Like I either need to expand that particular section or write a whole new, she's like, oh, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. I'm just like, really? <laughs> like, uh, tell me what to do. And so I was like, okay, well, I was playing around with this perspective from my, from his sister's per perspective. And um, I'm so glad that that happened because she was, she's such a, uh, a powerhouse and central figure to my family's history and a reason that a lot of this history, you know, was kept alive. So I'm glad that her perspective actually made it into, into the book. And I felt it was, did you, it was did definitely you actually get note. to meet her? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I knew her, I knew her growing up. Oh, you knew up. her? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I knew her growing, growing up. Um, so yeah, she, she, I mean, she's the one that told all the stories you know, like insisted, like my grandfather, his name was Coleman, he was born a slave, blah, 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 you know, so she, she's the one who told and told and told these stories. So, um, so I'm glad that that, that ended up there. And I felt like that was definitely, um, a stronger note to, to end on. Hmm. That's interesting. Cause usually I find that in, in the families, even though they didn't, the elders didn't talk a lot about it. There was mm -hmm. usually one person. Yeah. Well, she was did, that. That did that did listen. When yeah, they she was that me. one. Yeah. Yeah. She, she was that one. one. And then my and my grime side, there was another one who was the one, you know, right. who kept the story alive. I mean, she's she's the reason that we we were able to find the family. So I talk about going to Alabama and meeting my mm -hmm. family. She's the reason that we found them because so from the excerpt that I read, um, just a spoil a spoiler. Um, so when um Solomon dies, um, you've already seen that there's tension between Lucy and Solomon's mother. So when Solomon dies, like this is a story that I heard, she sent her packing back to Alabama. That that's you know what I know. And from that moment, which was I think he would have died probably in the 19 um, I think it was the 1920s or 30s. From that moment until the 90s. The two branches of the family, the Alabama branch, New Jersey branch, were separated, separated. not in communication. Mm -hmm. And so my aunt was able to find them in the 90s. And mm. she'd been looking and, and trying to find them like that whole time for decades. So she was, you know, definitely one who kept alive the family history. And so a lot of the that that section, you know, the the butter incident, she actually told me that um that was something that she remembered from her childhood. Um, so I brought that in there. And then when I went to Alabama and met the family, um, a lot of them who never left the South, you know, they told me more about Stella, you know, so ah. I, I got to see, I got to see um, one of my cousins was being adventurous with me. So we actually took a drive. She was living in the town not far from where they lived in 1900, that first census that I found. 
but we actually like drove past the area where they would have lived um, as sharecroppers on a farm in 1900, which was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then even, and when I, when we went there, again, just, you know, taking together all these facts and details, because, you know, I mentioned like, okay, well, the name of the town at that time was Reader's Mill, no longer exists, you know, and we talked to some guys on the roadside and we we're like, oh, there's a Reader's Road down the road a bit. So we just drove down to Reader's Road. We get to Reader's Road and she's like, oh, there's a creek here. My, my grandma always said we used to live on this side of the creek. Ding, 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 ding. You know, so I was like, oh, that was so cool. Yeah, it's an interesting journey when you yeah. start delving into the stories that were told and you find the, you, you either find, you find the proof by either visiting it and it's there looking you in the face. Yeah. Or you find the proof in the records. Yes. That they, that, that they left, that were left behind chronicling their life, however few or many there may be. Yes. They, you, you usually find that kernel of the story that was actually okay. true. Yeah. And it's interesting to walk those, to walk that place where they walked. Yeah. Where yeah. they grew up, regardless of the circumstance. Um, mm -hmm. Did you find it difficult to, to like, okay, so you blend in, in, in the to section you read, you talked about Solomon coming home with the candy in his pockets and the joy of the children. And you're blending, you you blended in this moment of joy into yeah. this otherwise moment of high tension and stress <laughs> among the adults. Yeah. <laughs> was that did you make a conscious effort to do that or was that yeah. something that you naturally did because that really is how life is. They they're not always all moments of what you know. Yeah, that that was a very conscious effort um and you know like there, there have been a lot of reviews of the book so far and some focus on the trauma, you know, and the fact that there's a lot of trauma in the book. I actually saw someone detail like every single incident of trauma in the book. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not showing also the counterbalances. And so this is one of those scenes where I felt like there's a counterbalance. And so, like I said, for, for Solomon, um, the great grandfather who inspired that character, I didn't know like basically anything about him. You know, but because I didn't hear any negative stories about him, I'm just, I decided, I was like, okay, he's going to be this kind of loving father, even though there's that moment with Lucy with his mom where, you know, it gets a little problematic. Um, you know, I'm going to show this loving relationship with him and Lucy. I'm going to show this love with him and his children, you know. Um, so that was that was a conscious choice to depict that, that relationship like that. Um, yeah. And it's a strong depiction because it, He's not. He does. He's not a. Um, actually, none of the none of the characters in the book are two dimensional. Mm. It makes him more three. It makes him three dimensional. Yeah. That he has. He's not. He's not. Anger. He's not. He he's not the quote cool, noble savage either. Where he's that, like. Yeah, he's like right. just this mighty part. He's like, oh well, he he told his wife to get out of the house, you know, and he knows yeah. how his mother is, you know. Right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I found it interesting the relationship between the men and their mothers in this story oh, yeah. on both sides yeah. of the family, this relationship, and why the women, why the women, um, you know, keep the, kept them so close. Yes. And not let them that keeping them, you know, so close to them, um, trying to avert something. That yeah. basically ends up happening anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I, I really wanted to explore that because that is something in my family. And um, like, where does this come from? You know, how's it evolved? And to me, everything kept pointing back to slavery, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so also to talk about trauma, you know, I feel like there there's still so much unresolved trauma that we're walking around and dealing with today. Right. And a lot of it points back, you know, not saying that that's the end all be all, but a lot of that comes from um, slavery. And I, I really, really wanted to show how you could do something to cope that was on one, one side beneficial, but also at the same time detrimental, not right. only to that person, but also to the future generation. To the future generation. Right. 
And so I think there's a lot of things in within like that quote black culture, like the whooping, you know, whooping and beating, beating children and actually calling it whipping, right? Like that's slavery. That is slavery. Um, and how people even today walk around probably like, oh, I got whipped and that made me a better person. And I got whipped and I knew how to respect people, you know, and it's like, no, no. <laughs> you got whipped because Massa whipped, you know, or the yeah. overseer and all that kind of whipped their slaves. Yeah to keep you in line, you know, and you're still doing the same thing. And it's like, okay, but yes, we know that, well, maybe if I didn't do that, this kind of kept me in line so I could survive. But to me, there has to be another way, right? Because obviously that's not helpful, healthy for you mentally, physically, emotionally, all of that, right? Right. But, you know, in doing the ancestry, in doing the genealogy and, and looking at other people's stories, regardless of, of race, mm -hmm. that past is, it cuts, it cuts across all of it. Mm -hmm. That's it right. cuts across, I don't care whether you were Irish or Italian or whatever, <laughs> it cuts across all of it. Yeah. And at some point you have to work your way out of that. Mm -hmm. To, to do, to get to what you would want to say is a better mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but then sometimes people can't even recognize what they're in, you exactly. know, because it's, it's my culture. It's exactly. just the way that we've always done it. And I don't know any different. Right. 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 And so this, this book is writing this book also to like, just bring awareness to, to all these things, you know, how, how trauma repeat, repeats, you know, alcoholism, abuse, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. And again, there are some things that people are walking around proud of where it's actually, no, this is really detrimental, right? And this is how it impacts one generation to the next. Yeah, the next. Yeah. Jackie, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say the residue of slavery in the colonial era is so much still upon yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I keep saying, when will the colonial era end? <laughs> He's saying, when will slavery end? <laughs> You know, mm. it, it's, uh, I feel like we're a few hundred years away. It's so bad. Mm. Um, you know, you got to have serious blinders on not to really see this stuff. I just wanted to say, I mm. think the writing is exquisite. I'm Thank still you. in the beginning section, but I, I, I have the audio and the physical book. Uh. So um, I'm trying to get... You know, my my problem is a problem I've had since I was a teenager. I'm more already reading. I'm always reading two or three books mm -hmm. at the same time. I've done that my entire life, so I I got to make myself focus. But uh, okay. I'm looking forward to to reading this. But I can Me say too. I'm impressed with the writing. It, it was really quite smooth. Things moved. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and I admire your project. Thank um, you. Yeah. Because this was a heck of a generational <laughs> work, you yeah. know. Uh, you got any film? Got any film people <laughs> for you? <laughs> well, I mean, Sarah Jessica Parker is my publisher. Um, um, so far, no. So far, nothing. Oh, but you know, it, it's it so actually early. Been out. Yes, it's early. It's early. Um, but yeah, everyone, everyone asks about that. Um, it's interesting because my next book. So my next book is um, looking at the slave trade in Ghana, West Africa. And it goes back and forth um, in time between the 18th century and present day. And it tracks three young women's stories, two in the past, two in the present. And um, that one always started out as a movie to me. I saw my character when I was in Ghana on the side of the road and I saw it crystal clear, you know? Um, and when I write in general as a writer, I see movies in my mm -hmm. head. So I mm -hmm. see everything and I'm constantly like editing the scenes and everything in my, in my head. So that one definitely, I'm like, oh, it would be like my greatest dream. But this one, I think because it is about my family and it's so personal and I'm already, you know, doing this other version of it. I think like if someone does offer to, to make it into a film or series or whatever, that my family would need to have input as well. Because with the book, I didn't, I told my family that it was coming out. Like, so I've had excerpts published um, before the book mm -hmm. came out. I made a conscious decision not to tell my family like what I was working on until the first one was coming out because I didn't want them to say like, oh no, no, you can't write about such and such because 
you know, mm -hmm. sometimes those are the most powerful things, right? And so like just just one um yeah, it's a part. <laughs> well one little one little detail um about my um the character um uh, inspired by my uncle who kills the cat like more than one actually. Um and my family was like, you're writing about what? And I was like, but that's so important and powerful. Blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't I didn't want them to come and say, like, you know, you can't write about this or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So you don't want to be um, censored. <laughs> what is it? You didn't want to be censored. I didn't, I didn't want to be censored. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, at the same time, I, I did want to be respectful um of my family. So I didn't want to like intentionally, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not writing this book to like trash anyone in my family. Right. Um, I think I actually, you know, treat some people a lot gentler, <laughs> you know, than they than they have been, even in the family stories. But like I think because again, um, you know, that's a medium that would be like more widely accessible than a book, then my family would have to have input and say like, do you actually want these stories? Because I mean, there's few people um, who are mentioned in the book who are still living today, but you know, that's someone's grandma, that's someone's aunt, uncle, you know, whatever. So I, I think I would want to consult with my family and make sure that they're comfortable with that appearing. Mm. Well, did anybody um, get mad at you? Did anybody they, did anybody in your family get mad at you for no so far? No, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people haven't finished the book yet, though. <laughs> 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 so we shall see. We shall see. But um, oh, yeah, so far, so, so far I've not heard any negative um feedback. And just at Christmas, um, you know, I was with family, and so we talked about it very, very briefly. Um, but it was, it was really interesting to get some of the feedback, you know, from them, but the things that I was hearing, it was all positive, but also hearing them say that like, oh, like, you know, I never knew what happened in between. Like, so, so there's some, some things that I'm making up. And so like, no one really knew what happened with uh, my grandmother. So the character Bertha is inspired by my grandmother. No one knew what happened between the point where she got kicked out of the house and she ends up like years later in Brooklyn. No one knows. There was no one I could find um, who could tell me. And so I made that up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was told like that it was believable, you know, like, oh yeah, that, that could have happened. Yeah, okay. I, I was yeah, like, I did. Perfect. That so, so that's where the fiction is coming in. And that's my strength as a fiction writer where, you know, someone actually bought it, that that actually, they're like, did you talk to seven of them? I'm like, no, 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 I just, I made that up. So good, good. I did my yeah, job. No, it, it, was, it was, it was, it's a seamless, it's a seamless narrative actually, because you, you know, and, and you're getting it from the different aspects, the different points of views. Yes. From different characters in the book of, yes. of a particular, of a particular incident that happened. Yes. And it's interesting how they all have the kernel, they all have that kernel of the truth. Yeah. And then their and then their interpretation of mm -hmm. what happened. And, yet, and so obviously like, some of the it's like a game, it's like telephone. You start yeah, and, and some of well, I just wanted to make clear too, some of the interpretations are bold faced lies. Exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It's not even the subconscious, like subconsciously I could write no it's just yeah, a lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a plain lie. <laughs> They yeah, just make so, it up, you know. It's but I, I, I love that about, about I love that about story. I love that about humanity. Yeah. <laughs> How um yeah, I, I just I, I love I love hypocrisy. I just I love hypocrisy, you know. Um and this this you know, a book like this exposes the hypocrisy because you see it, you know, from so many different from angles. different views. And yeah. it's, you know, it's really, really, really well written. And I, I started reading it and I was like, oh. I'm halfway finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it moves. It definitely moves. It moves a lot. Right? Like, you're reading it and it's like all of a sudden you're in it. That's it. <laughs> you know I mean, I, I, I have to say the same thing happens to me when I'm reading my own book, you know, because sometimes I just pick it up like, I just got, and I'm like, oh, wait, what time is it? Oh, and the audio book also. I mean, I start when I got the audio book. Um, I was just, I was just like floored. I was, I mean, it was such a surreal experience, you know, to hear someone else interpreting my interpreting words. Interpreting your words, um, yeah. And like, like, for example, the pose, the, the section that actually started everything. I was like, 
wait, this is way more funnier than even I thought it was, right? Because I was like <laughs> laughing all the I was like, oh, wow, this is funny. Oh, this is funny. Um, but, you know, like even with that, like I started listening at night and I'm like, wait, what's that? Is it one o'clock in the morning? And I was like, wait, but can I listen to one more section? Can I listen to one more? And I was like, wow, this is my own book, you know? So I was up, just up, up, up late several nights in a row listening to the audio book so yeah. yeah now it was really it, it really is a fabulous book I was like wow <laughs> I can't put this down um, <laughs> but I mean wonderful actually and it was a it really is a wonderful project and I really like how you put it together and how it came out on the page it really is a wonderful project thank you so I want to thank you so much for opening, <laughs> for being our first reader for 2024. Oh, thank you all for inviting me. And for anybody out there, she's going to be at AWP in Kansas City next month. So if anybody going to AWP, please look her up and and, and get a copy and have her sign it for you. She's <laughs> also going to be in the North Carolina area sometime next month. And she's also got a couple of thick gigs coming up in New Jersey, her home state. So uh, Look at the go website. To her, go to her website. We're putting it in the chat, um, and and look her up and see where she's going to be, and definitely support this support this book. And I want to thank everyone for spending time with us this afternoon, and I want to thank our sponsors: the Brooklyn Arts Council, Poets and Writers, the Park Slope Civic Council, the 440 Gallery the Garner Glazer Foundation, you, our individual donors, and our audience for making this programming possible. And I hope you'll join us next month because we are having a return of one of our readers from last year, the fabulous Glennis Redmond is going to join us next month. And she's going to talk about uh, a book that she worked on called uh, Dave the Popcorn. Uh, uh, folk artist from South Carolina, Dave the Potter, and I hope that you will join us for that discussion and reading next month. So I'm turning it back over to Joy. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Kim, so much. That was really fantastic. We're going to treasure this for mm -hmm. um, for months and years to come, and we'll send you a copy of the recording. And I can't wait to finish reading the book or listening to it. So, thank you so much. Thank you That's again good. for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Right. <laughs> Everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Rest of Same. the afternoon. <laughs> All right. Stay All right. warm. Bye. Bye-bye.